really our intention to do something that would go beyond what people were used to seeing. Otherwise, you're just going to be one of the millions of movies that get made and forgotten. There's always this idea that really great horror movies don't show it. The more horrific stuff. Baloney. I like when they just go places you would never guess. He's dead? Not anymore. I couldn't believe how audacious it was. Afterwards, I think we were all shocked by what was going on. I was like, oh my god, did you see all the blood? And it's so gross. <laughs> There's parts of it that are very funny. Oh, and parts that are just gross. <laughs> it was definitely the most gruesome movie I've ever worked on. These guys are coming in with their gallons of blood and cow intestines. <laughs> and Stuart would go, no. You know, that's not enough. And he was right, because it's timeless in its brashness. This is like the movie that will not die. I'm from Chicago and grew up there. I uh, was the artistic director of the Organic Theater Company in Chicago for 15 years. Um, my wife Carolyn and I started the company in 1969. We started it with our wedding money, <laughs> the money that we received as wedding gifts was put toward starting a theater company. We uh, were a theater that was dedicated to the creation of original work and we did all kinds of things. We did the world premiere of sexual perversity in Chicago. We worked with a lot of really stellar talent, Joe Montaigne, Dennis Franz, just a, a host of really fine actors. And I felt, you know, here we have these great, you know, performers. We really should create a movie for them. And uh, a friend of mine advised me that we should do a horror film because uh, he said it would be the easiest to, uh, kind of movie to find backing. I've always uh, been a huge fan of horror movies, especially the Frankenstein story. And my friend said, uh, well, have you ever read Lovecraft's uh, Herbert West Reanimator? So I started looking for it, and eventually I ended up going to the public library and found six little stories that he wrote in the 30s. And in reading them, uh, I was blown away. I mean, they are fantastic. And, they, and I could see the potential uh, as a film because they're so packed with action. I mean, jam-packed with incredibly shocking and often very gory proceedings. It's funny because it, since Lovecraft wrote Reanimator as a serial, my first thought was that we should do it as a series. It's kind of hard to imagine that now. But I thought maybe PBS wouldn't be interested in, you know, six half-hour shows based on these stories. So we adapted the very first one of the stories. Uh, and actually, it was a very literal adaptation. It was set in period and so forth. And PBS, of course, said, this is too much for us. We're never going to do this. So we took it around to a few other places and were told that no one was interested in half-hour shows anymore, that everyone wanted hour-long shows. And the original writer on the project, a fellow named William J. Norris, he got kind of discouraged and um, kind of turned it over to Dennis at that point. I'm a, a teacher, and uh, indeed I teach Gothic fiction, among other things. Stuart knew I knew the uh, genre and asked if I could take a look at this and maybe help uh, Gothic it up at the same time as maybe expanding it. So we went back to the drawing board and we combined the first and the second story into an hour. It was determined that the story should be updated, but we still wanted to be faithful to it. Right about that time, a friend of mine, um, Bob Greenberg, introduced me to a fellow named Brian Usna. I got into Reanimator back, in, back when, I, when I lived in North Carolina, and I was a horror fan. So I was looking to make a low-budget horror movie, and I wasn't the first, of course. <laughs> George Romero did it with Night of the Living Dead. Dave Friedman was doing it with Herschel Gordon Lewis. And I had saved up some money and felt like I could borrow some. And so I was interested in the Reanimator project. So I went to Chicago. He said, I think we should, you know, expand this into a feature. And I said, great, we can add the third story. And he said, no, add all the rest of the stories. So suddenly there were these opportunities to make twists in the stories, to throw in more gore, more excitement. Lovecraft pushes the genre in literary terms. So we were going to have to push the genre 
in filmic terms. And that was one of the original directives we had on this movie. I wanted to make it gory and sexy enough. I didn't want to skimp on that. Brian Usner said, uh, you know, let's not hold back anything, which I think was very good advice. So about every weekend, we'd go to Brian's house and we would watch videos of just about every horror movie that had been done in the last 10 years. Our goal, of course, was to find a way to outdo everything that we were seeing. Stewart's original idea was he wanted to shoot it in black and white and 16 millimeter at the Organic Theater. When we finally did have the, the financial backing and were ready to go, the board of the theater got horrified that we were doing a horror film. They weren't having any part of any H.P. Lovecraft. That was just too weird for them. You know, they said, you should be making an art film. So I said, if you won't allow me to do this project, then I'll take a leave of absence from the theater. And I came out to Hollywood and uh, directed the movie. Pre-production on this began with talking to effects people about how are we going to achieve this. We actually had the first the first meeting of, of mine, so to speak, in my backyard and over in Panorama City. The first thing is you get the script, go through and read it. And, you know, the first time when I read a script, I go through and start highlighting things that would be classified as effects. First, I thought, well, this isn't going to be you know, all that difficult, but it turned out to be quite a project. Because as we started listing out the effects, it just got huge, 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 huge. I mean, there were 89 separate scenes that had effects in them. And uh, we had to come up with a way to do these effects that was on a budget and a schedule. I mean, I had six weeks to build all this stuff. Then I actually sat down and storyboarded the effects sequences to make it clear to the effects people what I'm planning and kind of working out ideas as to how to accomplish some of these things. We also did a lot of research when we were working on the film. They gave me uh, a layer by layer dissection manuals and, and all that sort of stuff. Stewart had a friend who was a pathologist and this guy sent out some photographs of an autopsy on a person. I'd never seen anything like that before, and I was like, oh, man. But he wanted all that stuff to be uh, absolutely realistic. The casting of Reanimator was done in the classical, low-budget Hollywood way. We were brought in on auditions, and we were paired together with a certain someone, and I got lucky enough to be paired up with Bruce Abbott. My background is, you know, was the stage, as was all the actors in this film. You know, I think we had a chemistry together, and we really liked each other immediately, and. We were the chosen ones. Jeffrey Combs was known by our casting director for his stage work. And as soon as he read the role of Herbert West, I knew he was the guy. I was uh, banging around uh, Hollywood, L.A., trying to get, uh, you know, some work. You know, done a lot of theater, but not a lot of film. So for me, it was time in front of a camera on a set with a, uh, with a pretty good role. I went down, I picked up the sides, and played it like I stuck my fingers or something in a, you know, in a, a you know. I thought I had made a fool of myself, but Stuart said, wow. Uh, I left and went home and got word later on that I had got it. David Gale was another one of these actors that walked in, and when I met him, it was like, oh my God, this guy is like Boris Karloff. I mean, he really is. It's funny to say to someone, you know, you know what, you belong in horror movies. But uh, David really did. Stuart was staying at the Oakwood Apartments there on Barham Boulevard, and we went over there uh, and ran through the scenes. We did rehearse for a week before we started shooting, and we rehearsed it like a play. And very, very rarely do movies have rehearsals. But Stuart, coming from the theater, believed that, uh, you know, you need some rehearsal for the actors. I can't tell you how valuable that really is. He really knew what he was doing, and he was with us, and, you know, he was our leader. I took all of the actors to the L.A. County morgue uh, just so that they could get a sense of that world and what it's like. And that, you know, that was an incredible experience. And it's being around a dead person is not what you would imagine. It's very strange. You get no vibe, you get no rhythm, you get no... You get nothing. When you see a dead body, um, it is a dead thing, and it makes you realize just how magical this idea is, how truly incredible it would be if someone could bring the dead back to life. We did reshoots after the movie was cut together, and one of the reshoots was the opening scene. There was so little money, so little time and money to spend on this, that um, we decided it wasn't necessary. But uh, after we had cut the material together, 
Brian felt we really needed to go back and get that scene. I was very concerned that the audience wouldn't, um, wouldn't be ready for the tone of the movie if they didn't get a taste of it up front. Looking at the film now, I think he was right. I get a call from Brian. He said, we need a pre-title sequence. My God. And it was fun because I got to do some, some cool things with bladders and eyes. And what we did is I sculpted the eyelids shut. And I created a bladder that went over each eye. It was basically people going on these rubber bladders, you know, so you got these big old red eyes bulging out. Then we filled up the tubes with, with blood and put a lot of air into it. It was just one extra day to get that sequence. And that scene kickstarts the movie. It is taught. And it's a better intro for my character. You killed him. No, I did not. I gave him life. The young mad scientist uh, who doesn't mind that chaos is in his wake. We were thinking that maybe there'd be a series of Lovecraft films with Lovecraft's name above the title, the way that Corman did it, with Edgar Allan Poe. And the title sequences in those movies, I remember as being very vivid, you know, like really colorful. And uh, so that was kind of what we were going for with those really sort of hot pinks and bright colors and so forth. The opening titles were done by Bob Dawson, who has gone on now to be like the title sequence guy in Hollywood. I mean, he does all of Tim Burton's movies and those titles I think are so great, you know, and they really get you into the mood of the film. Stewart wanted a Bernard Herrmann-esque score, <laughs> and we know where that went. Richard Band got into a lot of trouble with this score because people thought that he had ripped off Bernard Herrmann's Psycho, and uh, it was just really awful because he was doing it as an homage. And Richard Band had a great influence on this movie. He felt like that the, mu that the music should, at points, indicate the comedy. Richard found a way to let the audience know it was okay to laugh without getting into the nudge, nudge, wink, wink kind of stuff. It's a sensational score, and you, know, you can't imagine Reanimator without this music. The budget ended up being about a million bucks, and the advantage Reanimator had going in was that there was nobody to answer to. You know, it was my money. <laughs> it was at stake. I was taking the risk. The people that I borrowed money from, I personally guaranteed it back. So it was really a stupid thing to do. But I was young, and I, and I just did it. We shot it at SNA Studios, which was a, it's a very old studio. Mary Pickford had shot material there. Uh, I mean, you couldn't find a more rundown uh, soundstage. Our dressing rooms were pretty pathetic. Chipped paint and rickety staircases and, uh, well, watch out, you know, holes in the floor. So it, it wasn't the best of the sound stages that I've been on. And it's kind of like, shows you how low budget this was. But I definitely feel that we had a special connection, all of us working on this movie, and we all loved it from the very beginning, and we were all in it together. And uh, what makes a successful movie is when everybody is on the same wavelength. If you can get everybody to pull together and focus on the same goal, then you've got something. Well, I was back in Chicago. By then we had two children, so I left them with a sitter and flew out here to do my piece in the movie, and I was truly a novice. But it was exciting. I was excited. Clear? We tried to be as faithful to the Lovecraft as we could be. All right, let's call it. But it does get problematic because he leaves a lot to the imagination. And the fact is, uh, as an adapter, you really need to make changes. For example, we created a character of Dan Kane. Okay. She just needs a little more time for the drugs to circulate. Everybody in the story is so insane, and uh, you needed a, a, a normal guy in the midst of all of this that you could identify with. Kane, we have done everything that can be done for this woman. She has not responded. She's gone. I describe Dan as the audience's response to this movie. If you're gonna emotionally connect to the movie, it's probably gonna be through Dan. He's kind, he's sweet, he's naive. Kane, your optimism is touching, but a waste of time. A good doctor knows when to stop. 
I related to him really easily. Take her to the morgue. What we tried to do with that character was to make him, uh, make the audience really care about him. Mr. King. Same ace. Another one for you. And so the backstory that we created for him was that this is a poor kid who, through scholarships, has gotten into medical school. And he has got a real chance at a real future. Everything is looking very rosy for him until all of that gets destroyed during the course of the film. Oh, I'm sorry, Dan. I didn't mean to scare you. No, it wasn't too bad, Dean Halsey. I just didn't know anybody was here. Until he meets this Herbert West. Dan, this is Herbert West. He'll be joining you in your third year. He was doing independent research in Switzerland with Dr. Goober shortly before he died. Oh. Mr. West, this is Daniel Kane, one of Miskatonic Medical's best young hopes for the future of medicine. What were you researching? Death. Herbert is a force to be reckoned with. I think right away I kind of like thought how, you know, fun this guy could be. Uh, Mr. West, this is our eminent brain researcher and grant machine, Dr. Carl Hill. Herbert appeals to all of our notions of never having to compromise. I know your work, Dr. Hill, quite well. Your theory on the location of the will and the brain is interesting. We spend our days bending over, acquiescing, and Herbert doesn't see the point. Though derivative of Dr. Gruber's research in the early 70s, so derivative, in fact, that in Europe it's considered plagiarized. Arrogant, okay, somebody might say arrogant, but from his point of view, he's stronger than you, intellectually. And your support of the 12-minute limit on the life of the brainstem after death. Six to 12 minutes, Mr. Uh... West. Herbert West. And he's annoyed when someone is wasting his time. Frankly, Dr. Uh, Hill, your work on brain death is outdated. <clears throat> I mean, I'm a student of his, and I'm calling him on his shit, you know? Looking forward to seeing you in class, Mr. West. I think that was just delicious. I love that. The thing about Lovecraft is that he very seldom has any women in his stories. And, you know, Herbert West Reanimator is no exception. So the whole idea of the dean's daughter was invented for the film. No! <laughs> no! No! Yes! Those early scenes were very intimate scenes, and working in front of 50 people, you sort of have to anesthetize yourself to what's going on and, and forget that the people are there and really concentrate on your partner. Bruce is a lovely person, and we had a really nice time together. I had some great chemistry with Barbara, and she was just lovely. Really nice. I mean, you know, it can be really uncomfortable. That was, I think, one of the first scenes that we shot in this movie, and, you know, it was a real bonding thing for us. We'd only known each other for a few weeks, and it seemed as if we were boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, we were very comfortable with one another. The minute you get your MD, I'll marry you. I think the ease that we felt with one another was evident on film. After half a day in bed with somebody, you're hardly uncomfortable anymore. A lot of really wonderful things happened in that scene that weren't necessarily scripted, like the whole being under the covers thing. Dan! <laughs> the original script had a lot more to do with Dan Kane and Meg. Stop it! Dan! Dan, no! It was a movie about lovers getting caught up in this situation. <laughs> And, and Herbert West was kind of the sort of annoying catalyst. You're on a hear about the apartment? <laughs> yes. But not really quite as front and center as he kind of became in the final cut. Didn't we meet this morning? You're, uh, West. Herbert West. So for me, I thought of it as sort of a nice supporting role. <laughs> I startled you. Yes, you did. Hmm. <laughs> He's the other side to Dan. Uh, may I introduce my fiance, Megan Halsey? Miss Halsey. Mr. West. He's going to drive the action. Does this building have a basement? All of us were really young in this movie, and we wouldn't know how to steal a scene at that time. Oh, oh yes. But Jeffrey is an amazing actor. Yes. I think this will be just fine. I mean, he was just so much this character and gave it its life. I think you and Mr. West have a lot to discuss before you decide anything. Oh, I've decided. And he's so quirky and so bigger than life. Well, you'll never even know that I'm here. Dan. Except, of course, on the first of the month. Mr. West.
he turned into. Sort of the star of the movie. Do we have a deal? At that time, I was doing business with um, Empire Pictures, Charlie Band. He didn't put a nickel into the movie, but he did provide some support. For instance, the first DP was a guy named Bob Ebinger, and he shot the entire first week of, 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 the, of the film. And um, actually, it was quite good, but um, Charlie Band felt that Mac Alberg would be a better choice. They called me at night, I think, and I started next day in the morning. And I never met Stuart Gordon in my life, but... Uh, I came to the set and it took me half an hour to literally fall in love with the guy because he is such a warm and wonderful person and very talented. But then on the other hand, he was totally inexperienced when he came to movie making at that time. The crew, I think, you know, at first they were going, who the hell is this guy? You know, and uh, well, you know, he doesn't seem to know what the hell he's doing. I would always be find myself standing in the wrong place. You know, I'd be blocking a light. In one instance, I even got run over by the dolly. You know, my, the dolly guy ran over my foot. And I was completely clueless about things like the screen direction. I remember someone saying, well, Stuart, you've just crossed the line. And I'm going, where? What line? Uh, luckily, Mac Alberg was very, very helpful and kind of explained things to me. I think Mac is the guy who kind of carried Stuart through his first picture. Every first time director needs support, he was a theatrical director. And the theatrical director who works on the stage, what he sees there with the light and everything is what he got. You know? But with film, it's something totally different. Mac Alberg would sometimes say, Stuart, uh, Stuart, I'm sure this looks absolutely fabulous from where you're standing, but you should really look through the camera, because from here, this looks like shit. Hmm, Stuart, we can't do this. Stuart, um... Your editor is going to hate you. I always say that the most important thing to be a happy cinematographer is to learn how to bite your tongue. Exactly in a good marriage, you learn how to bite your tongue. And then I remember a few times when we had disagreements, and behind Stuart's back, I said, you are a testadura. <laughs> you are really a, a too stubborn person for this world. I said to Stuart, let's do it two ways. Let's do it your way and do it my way. Most of the time when we saw the Daily, Stuart said, oh, was that my way? Oh, you were right. And actually, Stuart and I got very well along, and he's a very good director. Mac and I ended up really uh, bonding, and, and uh, I ended up doing, you know, seven more movies with him. Um, and as I said, he's the professor. You know, I'm still learning from Mac. The majority of the medical science that's shown on the film is accurate. For the autopsy victim, we created a foam latex prosthetic that was designed in reverse so that actually all the detail was on the inside of it and the outside of it was covered by a wig. So we used an extra with a bald head and I painted his, his bald pate to look like the skull. And then I put the prosthetic over it and glued it down and when we shot the scene, the actor grabbed it and peeled that back. It's very much like peeling a large orange. And it, it worked real well. Once the skull is plainly visible, you take the bone saw and you cut around the perimeter. Then we cut to a replacement body that was made in the same proportions as this guy. The whole top had been opened up. We had taken a plastic skull and I had cast the skull into it and inside of it I used uh, cow brains. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The human brain. I, I, I hate to admit this, but one of my big suppliers on this film was a local meat market. Once the brain stem of an individual, I'm talking about the reticular activating system, heart regulation, respiratory center, once these activities cease, the brain can only survive an additional six to 12 minutes. David is the quintessential um, ominous sort of authority figure. Six to 12 minutes. But he's a fraud. Until brain death brings about an irreversible conclusion. And he's enraged that I would have the audacity to, to call him on that. Mr. West, I suggest you get yourself a pen. David Gale was a little bit bigger than life. Class dismissed. And so we were kind of on the same page stylistically. 
How can you teach such dribble? These people are here to learn and you're closing their minds before they even have a chance. We all both understood that, that it was um, mano a mano between these two characters. You know, you should have stolen more of Gruber's ideas than at least you'd have ideas. Mr. West! It was war and who's going to win out? Out. There's got to be a pleasure to fail, Hugh. David Gale, he knew how to work a scene, and so, uh, you know, we really worked well. Working with Barbara was really easy. Please. Because you get half your performance from what's, you know, coming at you. Look, it's not you, really. It's just a lot of little things. I feel like I have to totally be in the moment with whoever I'm acting with. West is always in his room with the door closed. No. I mean, do you ever see him? Does he ever eat? I have to really see what is going on between us, really feel that. He bothers you too. And that to me is as important as doing the individual work on my own character. Rufus is terrified of him. When West comes in, he runs and hides. Rufus runs and hides all the time. It's standard cat activity. Yes, but not when we're together. Then he's all over us, trying to get your attention. and. I really liked Megan. Where is he? I haven't seen him since we got here. So I think she's a strong character, which I also liked. Rufus? Because frequently in horror or slasher movies, Rufus? the girls aren't very intelligent, and Megan was. She's definitely not a bubble-headed co-ed. She is a grounded girl. Rufus, are you in here? Very real and we bring ourselves to every role. So whoever she ended up being, I am part of that and she is part of me as well. Barbara was perfect for that role. She just gave her whole heart and soul. She just really knocked herself out. <laughs> Great screamer too, oh my God. What are you doing on my room? Oh, oh, Dad! Dad! I could be in my dressing room and hear her scream. I thought I was going to the private room, Dan. Meg, what the hell are you doing in here? In the fridge. We dealt with a lot of gross things, and yet it's funny. There's parts of it that are very funny. It was dead when I found it. You killed him. It does have sort of a farcical oh. quality, but it would be a real mistake to play it like that. What happened? It suffocated. It knocked the garbage over and it got its head stuck in a jar. You weren't home, so I put it in there. I re recall Stuart being approaching it very, very seriously. And I did not want to stink the place up. I was going to show you. This is not funny. This is not funny. There's no humor here. You couldn't call or write a note. I was busy pushing bodies around, as you well know. And what would a note say, Dan? Cat dead, details later. And it's made even more funny sometimes by not playing the funny parts, but playing for the truth. Because then you, you're not hit over the head by it. Garbage to garbage. The other guys all have these kind of flamboyant, flashy moments. <laughs> But the un unsung hero of the movie, I think, is Bruce Abbott. He's the one that I think is really carrying the movie on his shoulders. You know, Bruce were not in the movie, the, the movie would not work. West! And Bruce is fantastic in the film. I think I enjoyed that scene just about as much as I enjoyed shooting any of them. It's such a physical movie. The swinging light was an accident. We hit the light and Mac took the camera off the stand and, you know, things started to get very active very quickly. Hey! We shot it extremely late at night and we shot the hell out of it. The cat is a lot of trickery. There was a stuffed cat, not even a real cat, that they pinned to my back and I sort of make it move around and pull it off and throw. You know, it was like, did you get that? Because the lights just, there was a very small key light source and the light swinging back and forth would illuminate sort of what's going on. If you watch that sequence, most of the time, I never saw a cat. It's an illusion of what the actors are doing, what the lights are doing, most importantly, what sound is doing. <laughs> that wonderful last shot of the cat just coming right at the camera. He's a great topper to the whole thing. Everybody always talks about the cat sequence. Most of the time, Look out! there was no cat. <laughs> Death is the ultimate disease.
And, you know, what, what West is trying to do is to conquer death. It's really quite simple. All life is a physical and chemical process, correct? It stands to reason, then, that if one could find extremely fresh specimens and recharge that chemical process, bang, we have reanimation. Talking to doctors about what West was doing, they all kind of thought that, hey, that's a pretty good idea. The theory is not new, West, but my reagent is. If he were able to succeed, it would be the greatest achievement, you know, of, of all time, really. We can achieve every doctor's dream. You'll be famous and live lifetimes. We think of West as being such an insane doctor. You haven't done this on people. But what's so crazy about trying to prolong life? You will help me. No, because I don't believe you. Rufus wasn't dead to begin with. You drugged him and reduced his vital signs. You lowered his body temperature. He couldn't have been dead. Do you agree that he's dead now? Do you agree that he's dead now? The whole concept of reanimation has to be bought with the cat. So it's a real important um, moment in the movie. West, no. He's the one with doubt, and I'm the one who's sure, beyond sure. West, stop. It's yin and yang. It's point counterpoint. I'll show you. Then you'll help me. No. Yes, you will. That is why I brought the infernal beast back to life in the first place. But this is groundbreaking research here, and I need help. It's infectious. In the brain? Of course. He's got to go along because he knows I'm right. Don't expect it to tango. It has a broken back. God. Why does he make that noise? <laughs> Birth is always painful. So they were like two geeks in high school that both like, you know, World War II airplane models or something. He was dead. Twice. They were having a good time. The only annoying thing is that he has this girlfriend. No! Oh, it's him! What are you doing here? It's she just saps his energy, it makes him think about soft stuff and wrong, really wrong. Oh, I think there was definitely a triangle in the movie. Dan, what happened? It was incredible. I mean, it was an incredible experiment. Herbert West has overcome physical death. And it was myself and Dan and Herbert West. That's why I came. I, I tried to call, but no one answered. I was so worried. Megan and Herbert West were, were foes fighting for the same man. Frankenstein stories are, are masturbatory stories because they're all about creating life without a woman and it was interesting because meg halsey she's the one who really is aware that how completely wrong this is i tried to save him how unnatural it is now you'll tell halsey damn right we'll tell him and you'll be out of here so fast your head will spin the subtext for her character really is look you know you, you can create life with me don't you understand what he's done what we could do what about what we could do so I have to really hypnotize him to get him to, uh, to, to, to stay on track. Meg, he's right. Your father's wrong. Herbert represents work. Meg represents love and relationship. And can you have both? The only way, Danny. Herbert would say no. Damn. As far as Herbert's concerned, women are a distraction. <laughs> there was one sequence that I was very proud of um, that ended up getting cut out of the movie. That was ready. Your daughter has gone into an enchanting young woman. Oh, yes, she has. And uh, David and I, we were sitting around a table having dinner, and he's hypnotizing me. Meg has matured a great deal in the past few years, but she's still young and impressionable. And now Kane is rooming with that West character. Originally, there was a whole subplot in the film about how Dr. Hill had hypnotic powers. Kane is dangerous. He's dangerous. And he was able to make people do what he wanted. That was a way to explain why he could control all these zombies. Well, as it turns out, who cares? And it sort of slowed things up and gummed up the works at certain points where you just wanted to keep going. So it was cut. But actually, it was his hypnotic suggestions that made the dean uh, expel Dan Kane from the college. You will submit to me a written apology for this entire affair. You will, in any case, have your student loan rescinded. Student loan? That's one of my favorite moments. He's just seen the reanimation of dead animal tissue to life. And suddenly, what's more important to him is his student loan. I won't be able to continue school. But that's, that's close to reality. That will be all, Mr. Kane. I wanted to show how absolutely cutthroat it is.
Medical school is war. It's war between the students and faculty to see who survives. We did the makeup in an old sound facility called SunWest Productions down on Sunset and Western. I, I would not say that it really was a studio. It was just a, a, a big space in the middle of Hollywood. John was at that time teaching classes on how to do makeup effects. And so that's how we got our crew. I mean, our crew was, was, was my makeup class. A lot of them had virtually no experience. So we thought, okay, here's some free labor and uh, give them a chance to start building their resumes. And remember, I said we had 89 effects. That's pretty darn tough, even when you're using my students as the crew, you know. We got to the point where we just had to say, we're running out of time and we're out of money. What can we do? Charlie Band said, well, we can't give you any more money, but we can get access to John Beekler in his shop. I was uh, working with uh, Charlie Band's Empire Pictures doing a lot of special makeup and creature effects, and that's how I sort of fell into the fold, and it was a great experience. By and large, you work on a lot of crap, but I think in this particular instance, we saw, by virtue of the material, Yes, I think you. By virtue of the director, by virtue of all the people working on it. John Doe apparently just dropped dead. This ain't crap. This is good. He's been dead for hours. Any evidence of reanimated consciousness will justify proceeding. Stuart's motto was more is more. And Stuart uh, lived by that. 15 cc's of reagent being administered. He would keep pushing, you know, more blood, more foamy drool. More emotion, more passion, more this, more that. More yelling. You can't stop me. I followed you here, and I'm going to follow you until you listen to Megan, me. I love him. You're my daughter, and you'll do as you're told. More everything. And sometimes more is not enough. Something should have happened by now. But never less is more. Increasing the dosage, 20 cc's of reagent. Herbert, let's go! Oh, you'll never hear Stuart say you've gone too far. All of our choices were quite large, uh, driven very much by Stuart. Stuart didn't try to tone things down to make them more natural. But you know what? He was right, especially in the context of that uh, movie. Damn! And that's what makes a Stuart Gordon movie exciting. Good old Melvin. Well, that was Peter Kent. He had doubled Schwarzenegger on a couple of earlier things. Peter was actually doubling Arnold on Terminator while we were doing Reanimator. And we had a membrane with bladders on his forehead so we could inflate him and, uh, you know, make him undulate. Listen to me. And then Peter went nuts with it. He had a great time. I mean, it was pretty wild. Pete! Pete, open up this door! Is West in there with you? Yeah. That was fun. And we did it in sequence. They knocked the door down <laughs> on top of me. And Peter, he was powerful. Powerful guy. And totally free, naked. And then he picks me up and he throws me against the wall. There was a thing where he chewed off a couple of my fingers. That kind of gets your attention. They don't get to do any of this stuff every day. And then they had a stuntman that stood on a platform and he ran and threw himself at the wall. I'd never seen anybody do a stunt like that before in my life. So it was fun. And it was real easy to let it all go and to be there in the scene. We, we made a very unusual prop for Peter. We took a casting of his chest and made a fake chest. So he's leaning forward like this. This chest, fake chest is coming down like this. I'm down on the floor and I've got a fake bone saw in my hand with ground beef around it and a blood tube and we had pre-scored it. So as Jeff's coming up and working his action, I'm coming up and pushing this thing out in front. It's a very, very simple gag, but it was really effective. We went through gallons of blood. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so the floors got very sticky. And of course, right afterwards, they yell, lunch. Anybody hungry? Yeah. But this is the freshest body that we could come across, save of killing one ourselves. And every moment that we spend talking about it costs us results. Now, will you give me a hand? Everybody in this movie has a wonderful arc. Robert Sampson starts this movie as the most amiable, capable dean of a medical school. And in a minute, he's smashed by a door, thrown against the wall, he's killed, he's destroyed. He's dead. He's out of the movie, right? Um, apparently not. I'll show you. Seven, 17 seconds. Reanimation at 17 seconds. The eyes open. To die and then to be brought back. Doctor. 
I thought, wow, I can do that. Dad? Damn the bitch. Meg? It must not be unlike if you were unconscious and came back and figured out you were still here. And I couldn't talk, but I could make sounds. Ah! What is it? Are you all right? He would still have his thoughts. And when he sees his daughter, no! he's ashamed. So I went over and I hid. No, no! Don't make, don't go near. I wasn't playing somebody else. I was playing me in that, in that situation. What the hell happened here? Then you all right? And then that's... That's the only thing that we can do. That is Dean Halsey. Uh, that's the kind of stuff Stuart would, would work with you on, the reality of the situation. Bob is perfectly cast as the dad. He's the kind of man you would want to have in your life as your, as your father. Playing opposite him, I felt all those things for Bob. And when he goes from being the dad and um, the really grounded person to being the crazy, reanimated person. <laughs> It was very easy to feel really upset. I thought he did a great job. The thing that's really interesting is that in the first half of the film, West is the villain. Good evening, Mr. West. What do you want? And then Dr. Hill kind of emerges as even a bigger villain because he's a thief. He's trying to steal West's ideas. I want your discovery. You know, he knows how big an idea this is and uh, wants the credit for it. And our sympathies now shift to West. I'll have you locked up for a madman or a murderer. You will do what I tell you to do. Dr. Hill, he's got one goal, power. He's a madman, really. A bigger villain than West. So West, you know, to protect his idea, has to, you know, is ready to kill him. Magnificent. We did a couple of different shovels. We had uh, a real shovel, okay? Then we made a mold of that and we cast up a rubber shovel. And uh, Jeff just hit David with the foam rubber shovel. I will be famous. And they take a, a real shovel and go like this, but it goes out of frame. And then you see it around his neck. Now that's a cutout, the real shovel that we had cut a half moon out of. We had the fake head and rolled over, and the camera's down at his feet, so the shovel was blocking his real head. Very effective, but it's a very simple gag. Now we've got a fake head that is picked up and brought over and put in the, you know, stainless steel tray for that. We did a full head and shoulder cast of David, and of course it had to be made as a prop. I mean, on this budget, optical effects just wasn't in the cards. It was really a situation where uh, what you saw is what you got. The reanimator stuff. Parts. That was glow stick juice. I've never done whole parts. You know, you get these little ones and you break them and they glow. That's what it was. I think we went through 900 sticks. This isn't stuff to play with. It's an acidic formula that, you know, you wouldn't want to put it around people's eyes and things like that. And this was the first time it was ever used on film. Then we had um, the headless torso, which for close-up shots like this was basically a torso with a neck stump on it. But for all that performance stuff, it's just the old, you know, head through the table routine. We would cut holes in the various furniture pieces and slot him in, and he's down underneath with his head up through it. We had a couple of stainless steel trays, and one of them we cut a hole in big enough to get his head through. The makeup for the severed neck was also our gasket. And we can stretch this piece over David Gale's head right up to his neck, glue it to his neck, paint it right up to that edge, and then we would pour the blood in, and the blood is, is, is the saving grace because that's what hides things. Most of the time, it wasn't a dummy head. Most of the time, it was David. Well, I thought, cool. <laughs> I get to play a scene with a head. Yes. There is sort of a camp kind of quality to the movie. Yes, Doctor. And so it requires kind of a, a heightened approach to the whole thing. It has its own unique style, that movie. You It's high theater. <laughs> 
we had, I think, something like 48 pages of a character walking around without his head in this film. So we had to figure out the money shots. Uh, we actually had eight separate gags just for doing the severed head. And every time the camera angle would change, we would change the gag. We came up with like a Chinese menu of, of the head gags. We had a fake head with eyes closed and a fake head with eyes open, and we had the mechanical head. Animatronics was sort of in its infancy back then, and we were sort of playing with it. I made this animatronic head for a few shots. You could actually put my hand inside, and it, it, was, it was like a Muppet. For the shots of him walking away from you, we had a, a stump man who could put his head down real well. So what we did is we just put the next stump on him here, and Mac would adjust the camera angle down a little bit. So when you see Dr. Hill walking away, it looks absolutely fabulous. Sometimes he's carrying the head, and now we've got the close-up shot of David. I mean, that's him. And we had a full headless torso, which we could put David Gale's head through at the belly, and then have another guy come around for the arms. So we used a lot of old gags and cheats and stuff like that. But one of the main primary gags was David's head in the tray. Yes. That poor guy, we, we tortured him. He was in quite a bit of discomfort a lot of the time, and he was really a trooper about all that. Never complaining about it and giving amazing work. When we finished, he came up to me and he said, you know, Stuart, he said, um, he said, I want to thank you because this, you know, this movie has reanimated me. I'm very sorry to say that David Gale is no longer with us, and he was wonderful to work with. Uh, there, there was a good career cut way too short. Alan, I want you to come out now. There's a tendency to sort of assume that people who are great thinkers have no carnal needs whatsoever. But just because you are a, a brilliant scientist doesn't mean that these other things aren't floating around in your brain. And one of the ideas in reanimators is that when you are reanimated, you have no control over your sex drive. So once Dr. Hill is freed from life, uh, suddenly his id has gone completely berserk. He's uh, no longer hampered by uh, society's rules. And suddenly it's all about kidnapping the dean's daughter and having his way with her. I think even then, we knew this was the scene. This was the scene that people were gonna remember. That was, for me, the most difficult scene, and, you know, I'm strapped down, I'm naked, there's a gory head in front of me. I mean, you know, I was wondering, am I going too far? Should I be doing something like this? There were some people that said, no, you shouldn't do this scene. But I wanted to be able to commit to that moment as much as I could commit to any other moments in that film. So I said, okay, what the hell? I cleared the set, and we went for it. <coughs> and it sort of broke some barriers of what was acceptable to film. So the reanimated head is going to have sex with the dean's daughter. This poor girl. I think I've always loved you. But the question we had when we were writing it was, now how is he going to do this exactly? And I remember Dennis calling me up, chortling, you know, in the middle of the night, saying, I think I've just written the world's first visual pun. The head gives head. Oh, my God! Yes, my love! <laughs> when you're doing a scene like that, it just, it seems like an eternity. It was three hours or something like that, or more, maybe more. I don't even know. I don't even want to remember. I don't know. I must say, Dr. Hill, I'm very disappointed in you. You steal the secret of life and death, and here you are, trysting with the bubble-headed co-ed. We were very fortunate to get to do all the end at the end. You'll never get credit for my discovery. Who's going to believe a talking head? Get a job in a sideshow. Our last day was 16 long hours, and it was right before Christmas. That was it. We're pulling the plug at the end of this day. We cannot go another day behind this. I why an intelligent young man like yourself should make such a foolish, fatal mistake of coming here to challenge me. Yeah, that was a grueling, very, very uh, long day. I have a plan. So do 
I... That was the day with all the zombies coming out of the bags, a lot of action, and we were just grabbing shots and grabbing shots. You know, we just kept going and going and going into the wee hours. What a roller coaster. I was asked to come up with a few zombie characters. There were makeups. One guy's run over by a truck. The other guy had a sort of a shotgun wound to the side of his face, uh, the burnt corpse. And they had to be naked. They were naked all the time. Couldn't believe that they could actually get a bunch of people to do this. We had all those naked people running around, and the most important thing was not to show any frontal nudity, as it's called. So basically, it fell to Mac Alberg to just keep the camera away from it, to keep it out of the realm of being a porno movie. And he looked kind of distraught, and, and I went over to Mac. I said, Mac, you all right? It's the Venus. I see the Venus. I got Venus wagon in my shot. <laughs> and I don't know how to, how to make them go away. He had some framing issues, let's say. I'm so a laser surgical drill makes possible a new technique in lobotomy. The only opticals in the picture was the uh, laser drill. <laughs> the smoke was cigar smoke. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> the last day of shooting. Daddy, listen to me. It seemed like a big dance. It seemed like a massive choreographed dance. Look at me! <laughs> Just sort of like grab that, grab that. Okay, you do it. Moving on, moving on, moving on. So you had all of this stuff going, and everybody is running around and doing their own thing, and it is controlled chaos. You've got Barbara's father trying to squeeze the head. Then it went to a, a massive hamburger that Tony Dublin sculpted on set. He used hamburger and gel blood and managed to get a wig to stay on it. It was just like a big hamburger patty. But that's what Stuart wanted. And again, it's part of the humor. It's part of the gross out humor. You know, and he wanted to be able to throw it. <laughs> let it stick and run down the wall. And it did. It was great. Yeah, I told you I have a theory. One <laughs> Then you've got the body going nuts and rolling around. We went to a fake chest, and the rib cage was like uh, like the doors in a saloon that would just open. And there was an air mortar built into it, and so we packed it full of meat and rubber pieces and and just everything we could find. And then, of course, we triggered the air mortar. The intestines thing um, was my first experience with acting backwards. They wrapped me in the intestines and then pulled the intestines through the body and out into the next room so that when the film was reversed, it looks like the intestines fly out and grab me. The day got longer, but I was wrapped moderately early. Once I was done and lost into the smoke, you know, then they moved on. I was being torn limb, limb from limb. And it's very effective. I remember that we were shooting the sequence at the uh, uh, the elevator around four in the morning or something like that. Uh, Bruce Abbott and his corpse are rolling around on the floor. It's a wonderfully ragged place to be because it was the end of the movie. We were very exhausted, you know, just so tired. <laughs> So, you know, you could bring all of yourself to that moment. The actor who plays the, uh, that corpse was a real amputee. I believe he was, his arm was amputated just above the elbow. And he was covered in gelatin to look like he was burnt. And then we had a posable arm. So I was able to make that as a prop. And that also gave us the ability to separate it at the, at the elbow. And that's what gave us the piece for the cutoff piece. It literally just slid on and would hold on with that. So when it was pulled off, the arm gag on the floor was essentially just that part of the stump at the elbow. So we could come up through the floor like this, have the stump out like that, and the guy's actually just through the floor. It was just pretty simple. For me, uh, during the death scene, it was really um, Bruce's scene. It was really about him and, you know, his loss and his feeling and 
him trying to save me and not being able to. Hey, hurry, hurry, she's got enough. And I thought he did a wonderful job. You really feel his grief. Hey. Dan is, he's an idealist, but as soon as he realizes she's dead, then he turns a corner. I, I see Dan sort of plunging deep into sort of darkness and falling apart. I don't think in the beginning of the movie he would have chosen to reanimate somebody, but uh, you see through the course of the movie what he's turned into. And so at the end of the movie, he makes that decision. I think he does what everyone would do had they been placed in his situation. But Dan also must have a terrible memory. I mean, what part of this works? You know, what part of this really works? I love you. But that idea, for me, is what the movie's about. I mean, you know, life is what's important. And even if there are complications, you go for it. And wouldn't we prefer to be able to save someone, even if it meant that they were kind of messed up? And that was it. It was the greatest time. And it all went by in three weeks. It was intense, but it was short and intense. I did a, a kind of rough cut of the picture. Then I, I went back to Chicago. And the final cut of the movie was Brian working with Lee Percy, the editor. The cut that Stewart had of the movie was 135 minutes or something. It was really long, and Leap started cutting it down, moving scenes around. He really fashioned the material. A lot of the scenes that we cut out, I don't really miss them. <laughs> and then in the beginning of February, we did the reshoots, <laughs> like the opening, which I mentioned. Afterwards, Lee Percy put it together and I remember sitting with him and watching it. I just thought this was the best shit I'd ever seen, you know? I did not see the finished film until I came back to Los Angeles six months later, and there was a cast and crew screening. It felt like uh, an opening night for a stage play. It was thrilling. Everybody was really into it and just screaming and squealing. I closed my eyes, I didn't watch. But yes, I did, I peeked. I think we were all rather surprised and, and really surprised by how funny it was. You know, it was just really, really funny. But also really bloody. Oh my God. Everyone was shocked when they saw the movie. More shocked than I thought they'd be. David Gale's wife was there and she was so shocked that she got up in the middle of the, of the screening and she said, David, how could you? I think maybe she just thought, is this what he's up to? Is this his big job as an actor, you know? Yes, my love! I think it was incumbent upon David Gale to give her a little bit of a heads up, so to speak, that that was gonna happen, sorry. <laughs> then we took it to Cannes and it was just the best audience. At the end of the movie, they were stomping their feet and clapping in time with the music. I was going, man, this movie business is really great, you know? <laughs> and then I got a notice that it had won the Critics Award. So, uh, you know, my board at the theater <laughs> didn't realize it was, it was an art film after all. I decided not to take it to the MPAA because I didn't like the idea of somebody telling us what we could or couldn't do with it. It was a very brave choice of our distributor to release the movie unrated. And we realized that to cut this to an R rating, the movie would be about 20 minutes long, I think. But going out without a rating meant that we couldn't advertise the movie in a lot of newspapers. Most of the ads were white letters on black background. That's how the movie was sold. There was no big ad campaign. There was no PR for this movie, and yet it opened at the Paramount uh, across the street from Grauman's Chinese Theater, and there was a line from the Paramount all the way down and around the corner. And from that first scene when they break into Dr. Gruber's office, it was like, whoa! There was a hoot. The audience went crazy over it. They don't know whether to scream or laugh or both. People standing up and screaming at the, oh my God, what are you doing? not gonna do that! I can't believe this shit! Oh, no! 
Oh, 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 they're not, oh, God. It was the most vocal audience response I've ever heard. I remember we were coming out of the theater and some guy comes with his girlfriend and says, that's the best damn movie I've ever seen. I thought, wow, this is great. <laughs> A lot of the reviews were fantastic. I mean, the guy who really championed it was Roger Ebert, who wrote one of the first reviews. I remember Pauline Kael put it on her top 10 list for the year. And it, this was amazing to me because I had assumed that the critics were going to hate the movie. Dolls. Soon I got a call from Brian saying that um, Charlie Band was offering us both a three picture deal, including another Lovecraft picture. From the makers of Reanimator, from beyond. So it was at that point that I did formally leave the theater and move to L.A. and only to discover that these three movies were going to be shot in Rome, and uh, which uh, was another adventure. I guess that's another story. You know, Reanimator did well, but it was not a huge blockbuster. It wasn't some big box office smash. I don't think it was as big a movie as something like Halloween was. As a matter of fact, after it came out, it was forgotten to a certain degree. And, I mean, it took a while before it actually became something again. And I think it had a lot to do with the whole video revolution. Most of the people that I talked to, they got a hold of the tape. Like, you know, it was in my basement, I wasn't supposed to see it, me and a couple of friends, and you know, I got in trouble, man. <laughs> this movie, it allowed a lot of films that came after it to be a little more shocking if they wanted to be, to be a little braver than they thought they could be. Imagine if the movie had gone for a rating. Whatever works the best is what they take out. So Reanimator has a kind of an integrity. And today, I think Reanimator has a much wider audience than you could have imagined 10 years ago. It's funny, it's like a, I'm reaching a whole new generation now. I mean, you know, people are bringing their kids to see it. So many people talk about that movie with interest, you know. I was doing a movie a few years ago where David Bowie was one of the actors, and David came over to me and said, Mac, Mac, I heard you shot Reanimator. That's my favorite movie. I'm not surprised that this is a favorite cult film. I'm not surprised at all. I'm delighted to have been part of it. It's the, the highlight of my career as an actor. It's probably um, the part that most people remember me for. I think it really holds up today. It's still shocking. It's still out there. But I think it's a great story as well. I think the film holds up uh, beyond its shock value. There's a lot of realness going on between the characters, a lot of real drama. There's heart, there's love, there's heartbreak. It's satirical, it's frightening. You're lucky to be in one film that works that well. It's a mere 86 minutes, and uh, it, you know, it fairly flies. It's kind of like going on a new roller coaster. It's thrilling, and it's over before you know it, and then you go, my God, what just happened? Let's go again. Reanimator is one of those rare, rare movies where everything worked well, but uh, we were just doing a little movie and trying to make the best that we could with what we had. Looking back, I realized how incredibly lucky I was to have just the right people. Everyone was on the same wavelength. Everyone was doing their best work. And it was one of these things that doesn't happen very often. It may never happen for me again. Reanimator is now my middle name. It's always Stuart Reanimator Gordon. And it's in enabled me to work, you know, for 20 years, uh, you know, and uh, do more films. And um, so I, I can't complain about that at all. On the other hand, you know, people are always expecting me to outdo Reanimator. They always would say about my films, well, it was good, but it wasn't Reanimator. I guess you could say it's my Citizen Kane. You know, this is the film that will be remembered out of all of the films that I've done. I'm very, very pleased that the, you know people are watching the movie at all 20 years later, later, and uh, and that it still seems to have its power. Ah!